what a great day. We're going to be in the scriptures today in the book of Titus. So if you have a Bible, you can go to the book of Titus. We're going to be in chapter 2. Um, what we're going to be speaking about today, what I'm going to be hopefully uh, helping communicate from God's word is what is meant by Christian freedom. What is meant for us to experience freedom as humans? Yes, but also as uh, believers in Jesus Christ. What does Jesus mean when he teaches us about freedom? What does he mean? What, uh, what does it actually mean to be human? To that, I would say it's inaccurate to say that Christians merely value freedom. Um, it's better to say that there is no freedom, truly, without Christ. I was reading this book called The Air We Breathe, uh, by a guy named Glenn Scrivener. And in it, he makes a very big claim. He makes a, a, a great claim about Scripture in general. He says, The grand sweep of the Bible narrates the story of a servant Israel. Of, and you guys know this from even studying Joseph. The grand sweep of the Bible narrates the story of the servant Israel being freed from bondage. Okay? Uh, that there is bondage in this, in this book. The whole, the big story is that there's bondage and there's liberation. That that's the big picture and that's also the message of Christianity. And I would say yes to that. Absolutely. In part, that's true. The, you could see the gospel through that lens. Um, being freed from bondage into liberation is a major theme of scripture. It's a major theme of the gospel of what we believe to be true about Jesus. Uh, it could be in many stories. If you think even about Joseph's own life, I know you guys have been in a series there of Joseph going into, being sold into captivity and being freed uh, by God's hand. God, God moving in Joseph's life. Uh, even if we think about the story of Israel, how God freed them as well. And there's a lot to explore in the Old Testament, but what I want to do today is explore that idea or that notion of freedom in Titus. In chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. Um, so I'm going to read that for us. My paper gets blown around here by these amazing fans, so I'm going to probably use my iPad. <laughs> this is God's word for us today. It says, for the grace of God has appeared. Note that word appeared. We'll get to it in a minute. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly and righteously in a godly manner in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good. It's a beautiful text. Let me, let me pray for us as we get into that. Would you bow your heads with me? God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this amazing Scripture, I'm sure a favorite for, for many, as we return to this passage today and, and study it and open our mind to it, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would lead us, that you would be guiding us uh, with intuition and notions and ideas. Holy Spirit, you'd be speaking to our hearts. I pray for myself, God, that you'd use me. Uh, I pray for the hearers today, that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, a heart that longs to understand, eyes that see what you're doing, yes, in your word, but in all of our lives. So, Lord, would you bless us today? In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Titus 2, 11 to 14, very important passage for understanding Christianity, theology in general. There's a lot that we could talk about in that passage. But as I said earlier, I want to focus in on this idea of freedom. Uh, what does it mean to be free? What does it mean for Christians when we say the word freedom? Uh, what I want to do with that is, is show us that freedom is not normally what we would think. Actually, Christians view freedom uh, from three different angles. Okay? 
So typically, let me, let me illustrate that idea. When you think freedom, you probably think freedom from rules, okay? You get out to the Autobahn in Germany, right? You finally have no speed limits. You're free from the speed limit to go as fast as you want in your car. That's typically how we view freedom, freedom from a rule. But in Christianity, we see freedom has really three facets, uh, and we're going to talk about those today. The first is freedom by We're given freedom by something, or someone in our case, Jesus Christ. We're given freedom by Jesus Christ. Secondly, Titus 2.11 shows us that we are given freedom from something, from uh, overarching rule, uh, from the power of sin in this case, from the weight of sin, this thing that holds us back. And we're also given freedom towards something. We're given freedom to godliness. We're given freedom to life, to follow Jesus. Uh, And he enables us to do that. Uh, In the words of our text, freedom to live godly lives in the present age. Does that make sense? So those would be our three points today. We're going to explore freedom in uh, Titus 2.11 by those means. So what does it mean, first of all, that we experience freedom as Christians by Jesus Christ? What is that? What is the gospel for us today? Uh, the straight up answer, if I was just to say it really simply, is that the truest form of human freedom, there's lots of imitations, but the truest form of human freedom can only come from God's hand. Okay? It can only come from God. Freedom really, if we really truly want to be free, we want that sense of freedom, that sense of vitality, it can only come from God. The freedom that you most desire can can only come to you through the work of Jesus. And this is what Christianity would argue for. This is what Christians believe. And so why do we think this? This argument is built on a premise, a theological idea, that if the gospel is true... Okay, if, if God actually is God, if he is the God that the scriptures say that he is, if, if that God exists, and if, if the story of scripture is actually the truest story, then the logical conclusion is that without God, we don't have freedom. That if we lose God, we lose the possibility of ever being truly free. That's the logical idea based on those presuppositions, based on those ideas. If God is God at all, if the story is true, if you agree with me on those parts, then then logically the only way you could ever receive freedom is from God because you're powerless to get it. You're powerless to achieve it. And if we cannot have God, then freedom is lost. And this is a, a really big theme in the, in the book of Titus. And I like how the author, Paul, he doesn't really mince words. Uh, he kind of just says it matter-of-factly, says it very straightforwardly uh, for us. He, uh, he, paints, he really just paints the implications. It, if Jesus Christ is who he says he is, then freedom can only come from him. Straight up. And, and now the burden of proof to the listeners, to you and to me, is, is that true? <laughs> Is it true, if, is, if, if Jesus' story is true, if what he says is true about reality, then, then how do I grapple with this claim that I can only get freedom from him? It's a stark contrast. And I think for some of us today, where we're accessing freedom or trying to find freedom anywhere outside of Christ, there's a, there's a challenge for us right away at the very beginning of our text is where do you find freedom? And is it working? If you're finding freedom outside of Jesus Christ, is it working? Do you feel free? Uh, In verse 11, what's being said, not what's being proposed as an idea, not what's being simply uh, referenced to as a possibility, but what's being proclaimed, what's being demonstrated, what's being argued is that freedom has come by Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bible, look at verse 11 with me. This is what it says. It says, For the grace of God has appeared. 
the grace, the gift that we could never get, earn, or deserve, this grace from God, this mercy, this freedom from the hand of God has appeared. It has come to us, bringing salvation to all people, bringing life, bringing peace, bringing joy, bringing salvation from death, bringing salvation from sin. Paul is really summarizing in this one verse uh, the wonderful grace that Christians receive, this wonderful grace that Christians experience in their forgiveness. He's talking very quickly, the appearance of Jesus Christ has brought salvation to all people. It, and, it, and what's really interesting about this word is appear, the word appearance is that it means so much more uh, in the Greek than it does in our English language. So we're going to get into that. But I want to outline what Paul's arguing by using this word appearance. Paul is saying it's as if Jesus' cross work was the first and preeminent work. What Jesus did on the cross in dying for sin and reconciling God to man and justifying the sinner and, and redeeming you from your sin, redeeming you from your evil ways. What God has done, what Jesus has done on the cross, it is first. It is the preeminent. It is the top. It is the most amazing work that God has done. But it's merely the beginning. Okay? Jesus' Jesus's work is preeminent. Yes. But it's actually only the beginning. This is what Paul means when he uses this word, appearing. In another sense, Jesus' work on the cross is the starting point of the new life. It is the centering uh, place for us in our new life, but it is also the starting point of our new life. It's as if Paul is saying to you in this very simple short verse, yes, Jesus' cross work is important. Very, very important. Primary. Absolutely, 100%. You need to understand what it means that Jesus died to save sinners from sin. But... It's only the beginning. There's more. It's only the dawn of the new day. And I use those words very uh, particularly because that's really what this word appearing means. Um, This word appearing uh, in the Greek, I think I actually have a little slide for us what this looks like. It means the appearance or the coming into view or the dawn of the sun on a beautiful morning like today. This is what this word appearing means. It means the the breaking of darkness into light. This radiant sun enlightening all of the earth. This is what it means that the appearance of Jesus, the appearance of God has come to us. The appearance of grace has come bringing salvation to all who believe. Uh, like it says on the slide there, we see this word show up in other contexts in the ancient world uh, used in war primarily. And what it looks like is, oh my goodness, there's a giant army that has just appeared as if from nowhere. And it has a lot of implications for our lives. So the negative context, but the idea is this, uh, this breaking forth of a new perspective that has immediate consequences for your life. The appearance of the grace of God bringing salvation to all who believe. The appearing of the Lord is meant, the appearance of his grace is meant to evoke in you and and in me this idea of the sun rising out of the darkness. The thrust of the scripture's meaning is that while we are being saved from our sins, and that's important, that's only one very small part of the whole. That's only just the beginning. We're meant, actually, to live for a lot more than just being saved from sin. Amen? You're meant to live for a lot more than just being saved from the sin of your past or just being saved from your worldly desire. You are meant to live, yes, by the life of Jesus Christ. Yes, you are, you are freed by his work on the cross. But freedom, people, is so much more than that. There's so much more to salvation then our sins being washed away. Although that would be worthy of eternal celebration, just that itself. But there's even more for us, as if the sun is just coming on the horizon. 
And, and it's actually ironic, and I want to kind of camp here for a minute or two. Uh, it's as if some Christians, right, when they experience the salvation of God, I'm guilty of this, okay? We experience the salvation of God, and we say, hey, that's enough for me. I'm no longer, I'm no long, God no longer sees me as a sinner. Perfect, right? That's it. That's all I need. That's what I need from God. I've got what I need from him. I'm no longer a sinner in his sight. Amazing. I would liken that too, okay? Someone waking up on a nice, beautiful day, looking outside and seeing the radiance of the sun and saying, wow, what a beautiful sun. What a beautiful morning. Perfect. I'm going to go back to bed. Okay, this is what it means. They're not living now into the daylight. They're not living now into this new freedom that has been given to them by Jesus Christ. They're not taking advantage. They're not leveraging this idea that they have been freed not only by Jesus Christ, but for something, for a life, for a life that's not powerless under sin, for a life that has power unto godliness, to live as if you are a son or daughter. We don't want to be Christians who merely look out on the sunshine of salvation and go back to bed. Okay? We want to, we want to get out of bed. Right? Wake up these dry bones and live into the dawn of the new freedom of the cross. The freedom that God has on offer to us is given to us by Jesus Christ. And we see that in verse 211. And actually, if, if you want, you can go there with me, but I'll just read it. You see this also, the same point being made by Paul later in, in Titus chapter 3. He says, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, same word, he saved us, not on the basis of our deeds, uh, which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. This is what it means that grace has appeared to you and to me. It's that I have not been saved on my deeds, but because of a gift of God. I've been saved from my sin, and I have been washed and regenerated. I've been made new. I've become a new person in Jesus Christ. What Paul, the author, is getting at is that we cannot access this freedom on our own, and that we actually do need God's gift for us, to give us grace. Uh, there's, a, there's a story that I tell, and it was, it was shared to me in a season uh, where I was feeling powerless to my sin. And uh, there's, the story goes, there's this man, has anybody seen the movie Soul by Disney? Anybody seen that? You can admit it, it's okay. All right, so Soul, he's walking along the street, and he, sees, he doesn't see the manhole cover and he falls down the manhole cover. Let's just call our buddy Jim. Jim falls down the manhole cover. He's in a hole alone. Okay, so Jim is praying and he's crying out. He says, God, will you send somebody to help me, please, right? And guess what? His doctor comes along. He's like, Doc, it's me. It's Jim down here in the hole. Help me out. Doc says, hey, Jim, oh my goodness, how'd you get down there? I didn't see the manhole, and I fell, you know, I fell in the manhole. Help me out. Will you please help me out? And so Doc says, 100%, I'll write for Tylenol 3s right now. Right? So he writes a script and tosses it down the hole, and he says, good luck, Jim, and he keeps walking, right? Same thing happens to Jim. His pastor comes on by. He says, pastor, pastor, let's use Norm, okay? Pastor Norm, I'm down here in the hole. Help me out, Pastor Norm. Jim, is that you down there? Yeah, it's me, Norm. I'm down here. 100% I'll help you out. Goes, writes out a beautiful prayer, best prayer you've ever read. Amazing prayer. Says, hey, here you go. Th thank you. Are you going to help me? See you, bud. Right? And so Jim's still, uh, Jim's still in the hole, man. Eventually, Jim's friend comes along. Let's call him Bill. Bill, I'm down here in the hole. Help me out. Bill says, right away, 100%, and Bill jumps in the hole. <laughs> what are you doing, Bill? <laughs> now we're both in the hole, you idiot, right? Yeah, and, and Bill says to him, I know, and I've been here before, and I know how to get out. Follow me. And this is really what, what Christ does for us, that he he comes into our place, into our space, into our circumstance, where no one else could reach us, where nobody else would come, 
He gets into the hole with us and by his power, his amazing ability that only he could do, he helps us out. He brings us out. And this is what it, in part what it means to experience freedom by Jesus Christ. And in verse 11, it's as if Paul is pointing to this initial appearing, the breaking of a new day, and he's inviting us, don't just go to bed. Don't just look at the sunshine and go to bed. Live into the dawn. Live into the new day. Live into this new life. Come out of the hole and live, man. According to the next verse, the appearance of Jesus Christ also means something else. It means not only that we live by the freedom of Jesus Christ, but that we live from, right? That we experience freedom from <clears throat> ungodliness and worldly desire. And that's my second point, that we, yes, experience, we experience freedom firstly by Jesus Christ, but secondly, if you were to shift the diamond, the, the third perspective, or the second perspective on this idea of freedom, is that we experience freedom not only by Jesus Christ, but from uh, the power of sin. Christian freedom is not simply a one-faceted thing. It's not only a joy to be identified with Jesus and be saved by him, and we revel and celebrate in that, but we also have a freedom from the power of sin that was too heavy for us to bear. I want you to think of Christian freedom as something that's not only given to you by someone, but given to you so that you experience freedom from something. Right? Maybe it's worldly desires. Maybe it's the power of sin. I don't know how you would, how you would identify it with that. But the second way Christians experience that freedom, look with me at verse 12. Okay? I don't know if we have it there on the screen. Verse 12, we have been given, uh, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us. This grace that we've experienced, it has appeared to us. We've given, been given it. It's grace. But also, it's instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desire and to live sensibly and righteously in a godly manner in this present age. This grace has appeared to us and it instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desire. Simply put, there is a freedom from God, there is a freedom or a grace from God that has appeared and it is now enabling you. Okay? It's not just a status anymore that you're no longer seen by God as a sinner. You're now seen in him as his son or his daughter, but now it's enabling you to be free from the weight that you could not carry before, to be from uh, your heart's worldly desires. Freedom is a gift uh, by which we receive the work of Jesus Christ, and we also receive a power to overcome sin. And this is the easiest, I would say, the easiest way for us to understand freedom in our day and age, right? I mentioned it earlier. It's like a freedom from a rule. You, know, you now no longer need to go this speed limit. You are free from those rules. You know, if you could think back to when you were in high school, right? Might be a while ago, might be a long while ago, might be right now. But think back to when you were in high school, okay? Mom and dad are going away for the weekend. They say, take care of the house. And you think, I'm free, <laughs> I'm free to do whatever I want. I'm free to ha live however I want. I'm free from my parents' strict rules, right? This is really how our culture views freedom. It's, it's true. That is, a, that is a form of freedom, but it's only one part. Um, <clears throat> this is a major theme in, in all the scriptures, this idea. And it goes all the way back to God's abolition of slavery in Egypt with, with the Hebrew people. He brought them out of Egypt, right? He, brought the, he, he freed them from the rule of Pharaoh. He freed them from this power and this weight that they could no longer bear. And now they were free to live as they chose. It's, uh, I think it's an interesting observation, right? This idea about the people being freed from Egypt. You and I, I see myself in them. When we see the people... Uh, freed from Egypt, out of, out of Pharaoh's rule. What we then see immediately following is although God gets e them out of Egypt, he spends the next 40 years 
trying to get Egypt out of them, trying to get their slave thinking out of them, trying to get their going back to their master thinking out of them, trying to get their reliance and their trust built in God. He's trying to put that in them, right? Being freed from the power of sin is a sanctification process. It is something that we do learn. In the same way, God gave uh, his teaching to these people. He's teaching them no longer to live as slaves to Pharaoh, but to live in light of their freedom as the people of God in the desert. And we see God renewing them and washing them and giving them uh, grace and truth in the Ten Commandments, in his law. Again, try to comprehend Christian freedom as three freedoms, okay? The first one is freedom by Jesus Christ. Secondly, freedom from the power of sin. And third, uh, it's, it's that you're freed to live as you truly want to, as you were made to. Before we go on to the last point, I just want to spend a moment in camp in this idea of being freed from something. There is a lot of shame uh, in the church, around the idea of unconquered sin, right? Maybe you're here today and you're listening to me preach. You've never seen me before. You don't know who I am, but the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about your secret life. What's really going on on the inside? This habit you haven't been able to break, this difficulty that you haven't been able to overcome, this weight that bears down on you that you feel you must keep secret, that you feel that you must carry on your own. I so badly today want you to realize you don't have to carry that. You don't need to carry that. Yes, I'm glad that you're a Christian. I'm glad that you got your fire insurance, okay? I'm glad that you were saved by Jesus Christ. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop by merely a status change. That God actually wants to reach into your life, into your circumstance, exactly what you're going through, this weight that you think you need to keep private. And he wants to bring it to the surface, painful as that may be, and release you from the power of that sin. He doesn't want it to crush you anymore. He wants you to live into this freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from this weight that you cannot carry. to simply come to him, right? Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and find rest. Take on my yoke, take on my teaching, my ways. My burden is light. My teaching is easy. My burden is light. Carry that instead. Come to Jesus simply and give that to him. Experience what it means to have freedom from the power of sin in your life to step into honesty with God, to step into reality with God. The last freedom I would say is freedom too. The last freedom we'll talk about. We experience freedom by the work of Jesus Christ, this great appearing of the dawn, breaking into our darkness. We decidedly get up in the power of the Holy Spirit, look on the sunshine and decide to live into it bringing our sin into the light, bringing our brokenness into the light and saying, Lord, I don't want to live in the darkness anymore. I want to live in your light. I want to live in your ways. We experience freedom from the power of sin, from the power of darkness. And lastly, we experience freedom to live a godly life. In the last little bit of this passage, we see that we are enabled, we're enabled to live a godly life as we are washed by the Spirit. Or as it says in, you know, Bible speak, regenerated, renewed, remade, recreated, reborn, born again, given new life, given a fresh start, given a blank slate. We're washed by the renewing love of the Holy Spirit. We are enabled to live a godly life As if we were justified. As if you're justified. Because you are. There's a, um, there's this interesting uh, illustration I want to share with you of a famous composer named Igor Stravinsky. He's a Russian composer uh, and um, conductor uh, that passed away not too long ago. And I was reading about this in a a book um, 
and uh, called The Anxious Generation. And it was talking about this idea that this composer experiences when he has literally no boundaries. Okay? So we want to experience freedom. And I think in our culture, what we see is freedom is, is no boundaries that I can live and be and act however I want to be and do and, and think. Whatever I want to be, I can become. And this is the value of freedom in our culture today. And it is decidedly different than Christian freedom. Okay? Yes, we experience freedom by Jesus Christ, freedom from the power of sin, but there's a third side to this as well, that we experience freedom to live God in godliness, to live godly lives in the present age. When we have no boundaries, when we have no way of going forward, we actually revert to slavery. We actually revert back to our slave thinking. To hearken back to this idea of, of the slaves leaving Egypt and going into the desert, what, what happens to these guys? They actually, without a law, without the truth of God, without the Ten Commandments in this case, without the gospel coming to them in that way, they actually revert back to slave thinking. They revert back to hoarding the food. They revert back to broken, unhuman or inhuman ways of life. The argument from Titus is the same here, that you're not only freed from the power of sin, but you're also freed to live as you ought, to live into godliness, to live as you were made to live, to become the man that you're supposed to be, to become the woman that God's called you to be. You need help doing that. You need the Spirit's work. You need his regeneration in your life. You need his renewing power, his recreating power. And it can't come from you. It comes from the grace that's appeared. But you can't simply stay as somebody who's freed from the power of sin. It is simultaneous. To be free from the power of sin means to be freed to live a godly life. I want to share with you in that context this quote from uh, composer Stravinsky. He says um, when, he was, when he was feeling the anxiety induced from writing unrestricted music. Okay, with no boundaries, no keys, whatever you want. Uh, this is what he said. As for myself, I experience a sort of terror at the moment of setting to work and finding myself before the infinitude of possibilities that present themselves. I have the feeling that everything is permissible to me. And if everything is permissible to me, the best and the worst, if nothing offers me any resistance then any effort is inconceivable and I cannot use anything as a basis. And consequently, every undertaking becomes futile. I think what he words so well in that statement is that without a way of life, without, remember, if God is who he says he is and the story of scripture is actually true, then being freed means being freed by God from the power of sin and to live like him. Without the basis for that, without a way of life, without a God to worship, without a God to love, without instruction from him to love what is right and to hate what is evil, without that knowledge of the gospel, without that, that redeeming and beautiful power of God's word, every work becomes inconceivable. Truth loses meaning. It loses beauty. Life loses meaning. Life itself loses its beauty. And we're, we're lost in this freedom that we wanted, that we thought we wanted. To be free means to be free to do what you were made to do, man. It means to be free to love as you were truly meant to love. To, as Augustine would say, St. Augustine would say, to reorder your loves. To, to, to love the greatest things and to not love the worst things. To love what is right, what is true, what is lovely, what is beautiful, what is good. When you're freed by Jesus and you experience freedom from sin, you also experience a new freedom toward godliness. It does take one thing. <laughs> it takes your effort. It takes you trying. 
It takes you believing that and embodying that in your life. It doesn't mean that if you try super hard that you will love things more than other people, that you'll be more godly than other people. But what it means is a surrender to this love, a surrender to this truth, to this hope. That if God says who he says he is and the story of scripture is actually true and I really am freed by Jesus from my sin, then he's leading me into a life. He's leading you into a life where probably your wildest dreams would come true, right? This idea of of being close to God and enjoying him forever. Everything else would point toward that cause. Everything else would be grounded and rooted in this idea that your family, your home, your work, the way you live and, and be in the world becomes an experience of Christian freedom. When Stravinsky is saying this, he, it's only when Stravinsky finds solid ground. All right? It's only when he finds a key to write within, a boundary, Right, if you're a software developer, a software developer, like a concrete garden, this idea where these boundaries actually help us create something beautiful as it was meant to be. It's only when he finds solid ground, the solid ground of notes that he can choose or is limited by. It's only in order to, uh, uh, in order to make the music, or to make sense of the music that he creates. Later, it's not on the it's not on the screen, but what he says. Uh, about this idea of boundaries, helpful boundaries. He says, what delivers me from the anguish uh, into which an unrestricted freedom plunges me is the fact that I'm always able and ready to turn to concrete things that are in question. The greatest example I can think of outside of Jesus Christ with regard to freedom too, this third type of freedom, is a godly marriage. Okay, if you're married, you'll know what I'm saying. Even if you're not married, you'll know what I'm saying. So when it comes to choosing a spouse and deciding to dedicate your life to loving them, to making a commitment toward them, you are, in other words, saying of you, right? Maybe you don't actually have a lot of options. Maybe they're your only, they're your only option. But let's just say you had a lot of options, okay? And you're saying, out of all these fictitious options, <laughs> I'm choosing you, to dedicate my life because only when I choose one person and live by that restricted rule and live by those restrictions that culture may not promote do I experience the freedom and the love and the joy that marriage actually promises. Do I experience intimacy with one person? This is kind of like the freedom that Jesus is calling you into. It's only when you dedicate your life to him And you say to him, Lord, I want godliness. I want the beauty. I want what's what's good and what's true in my life. It's only when you dedicate your life to that aim and that aim alone do you really experience what the Bible calls freedom. To be wed or to be married to my wife is a freedom that I and I alone get to inhabit, right? It's a freedom that a spouse is enabled to. It comes from from a joint decision of me and her surrendering our freedoms to one another. And so really, the Christian idea of freedom is surrender the myth that you could make your own freedom. Surrender the myth that you, could, that you could be free on your own, that you could figure it out and have this full and wonderful life on your own terms. To live a life free to do, the godly, to do godliness, to do the godliness of God is only available when we have surrendered other freedoms to him in order to do so. It's only as we let go of worldly desires that we experience the goodness of God in our lives, and in this age. I love, uh, Dallas Willard wrote this in his book, Life Without Lack. He said, the gospel that Jesus himself proclaimed and manifested and taught was about more than his death for the forgiveness of our sins. As important as that is, it was about the kingdom of God, God's immediate availability, his with us-ness that makes a life without lack possible, a a life of freedom. 
It's God's presence with you. It's the Holy Spirit working and moving and, and regenerating you, giving you a new heart and a new mind. This is where Christian freedom lies. And so I hope you can see in the scriptures that freedom, the freedom that Christ offers us, it's freedom by him, from ungodliness, and to godliness. The scriptures tell us that by the power of Jesus' resurrection, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, that we are free to live in such a way that we experience the freedom of God. It's inaccurate to say that Christians value freedom. It's better to say there is no freedom, truly, without Christ. And so I just invite you today to pray with me. And as you, as you turn your heart to prayer, this isn't about me, it's about you and God, okay? As you turn your heart to God in prayer, ask him, Lord, what do you have for me in this life? Ask him, Lord, what does freedom in you look like? Where are you calling me? What are the dreams in my heart that are yet, yet unrealized? Take some time to be with God and I'll pray for us. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for your word and we realize the, the stark contrast of biblical freedom and worldly freedom. Uh, Lord, we confess the distortions of freedom that have led us into slavery to money, that have led us into slavery to material things, that has led us into slavery toward other people. Lord, we ask that you would release people today from the power of sin in their lives. God, I pray that we would be Christians who wake up to the new dawn and live in the sunlight and live into the life that you've called us to. Lord, we proclaim with scripture as for, for freedom that Christ has set us free. We ask Jesus that you would work in our hearts and our minds. In your name we pray, amen.